So we have uh, about six participants here right now, but uh, I suspect we, the number will go up in about a minute or two. Um, but we have no real way of telling. The beauty of this is the people who are here are influential, like Ron, Igor, Money, all of these are, uh, you know, significant thought leaders. Um, two things before we start. One is the Linux Foundation antitrust policy. We obey that as far as uh, the current antitrust policy of the Linux Foundation. You can find, find it on their website. The second one is the code of conduct, which is uh, basically something that says that we should be treating each other with respect, even when we are disagreeing, which is a, a, always a good thing. So without waiting too much, I'm going to present uh, here Angel Alban and Marvin Buntugan, who are going to propose a new MBS uh, subgroup and they will uh, go through the details of MBS and why it is appropriate to put it on the blockchain and so on and so forth. And why it belongs in the greater umbrella of capital markets, uh, which they have started, which they'll start to do, but you know, they're, they're probably going to uh, uh, spin off if they feel that that is necessary. Uh, so they are the co-founders of uh, Zventus, as you can see from behind uh, Angel's beautiful background there. I don't even know which city that is, probably. Los Angeles. Okay. Uh, yeah, I should have guessed by the huge spread of low-lying buildings in the background. Anyway, I leave the presentation to Marvin and Angel. Excellent. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. My name is Angel Alban. I am the president of Zventus. Uh, Marvin, if we can put the uh, presentation up on the screen. So first, I'd like to thank the Hyperledger organization um, Vipin, uh, Kurthy, we and Karen, who we met with uh, last week to talk about how we can start a conversation, and more importantly, how we could start a mortgage group to bring mortgage professionals from around the world together and start sharing and collaborating to start exploring how we could advance uh, blockchain technologies in the mortgage vertical space. So thank you for that. Um, ne next slide. Just to give you a little bit of an intro. I'm based in Los Angeles, as you can see uh, from my background. I'm up here feeding the pigeons today. Um, my background is in mortgage banking. I, uh, our team, uh, we have a bigger team than is represented here today. We've all worked at some of the largest mortgage brands around the world. I've had the privilege of living in London and, and, and being part of a joint venture with Barclays Mortgage for four years. Um, learned a lot about uh, mortgages, uh, how they operate uh, in different countries in Europe, a um, little bit in Asia. So there is a lot of similarities uh, in the mortgage world uh, from a professional standpoint where we're helping people um, with their biggest investment in their lifetime, which is a home loan. And it's a very personal asset. It's the home, that's where family is. And in many countries around the world, it's multi-generational. So it's a very, very important uh, asset class as well as a very important uh, financial instrument. So um, with that, uh, I'm just going to hand it over to Marvin to introduce himself a little bit and, uh, and then we'll get started on the, on the presentation. Thank you. 
Thanks, Angel. Um, this is Marvin Van Tugen. Uh, thank you guys for uh, allowing us to present today. We really do appreciate the, this wonderful opportunity to work with you guys. My background is um, I, I came from Deloitte Consulting. I started working with Deloitte, uh, working with uh, different financial services clients straight out of graduate school. And, and after Deloitte, I went to go work with um, a dot-com startup back in 2002 called At Stake. Uh, they were an information security company. Then after that, I went to go work with uh, Countrywide, and, and that's where I met Angel and started our professional relationship, and, and glad to call Angel a friend now as well. So uh, from Countrywide, and I, I think everyone understands kind of uh, the history of Countrywide, I, I went on to work uh, again back in, into consulting, and then uh, I did a startup called The Closing Exchange, which was an online closing company. And that kind of brings us back to where we're at today uh, with uh, this presentation. So back to Angel. Great. Well, thank you, Marvin. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Next slide. There we go. Okay. So, a slight delay in uh, uh, updating the pages. So, uh, thanks, Angel. So, um, what we wanted to do on this slide is really just talk about what we want to accomplish within the mortgage subgroup. Uh, I'm not going to go over every bullet here. I, I don't think you guys want to listen to me read all, all these bullets. But from our attendance at the Hyper Ledger Global Forum a couple weeks ago, we were very impressed with the community and approach of the Hyper Ledger team. Um, a after that presentation, after that forum, uh, Angel and I got together and we thought that it would be a good endeavor to build a mortgage subgroup with that same ethos and, and of openness and community that you guys have within Hyperledger. And it, that's really underscored by the fact that you guys open with the values of the Hyperledger community. And we want to leverage that community uh, to help implement blockchain technology. In the next couple of slides, probably slides three through eight, uh, we want to give you guys some some data on the mortgage market. I think a Angel uh, talked a, a little bit about what a mortgage means to the general population, but we wanted to share some data. I think several of the people on this call probably have a mortgage background. I know Vipin has a very strong mortgage background, so the, some of this information may not be new, but we thought we'd cover it really briefly anyway. So. Um, if you take a look at this slide, you can see that there are over 13,000 financial institutions in the U.S. That's a significant number, and that doesn't even include the third-party vendors that help support the mortgage market. We'll cover that on the next slide. Um, the overall size of the mortgage market, $11 trillion, that is pretty significant. And also on the next slide, we'll see that in comparison to the overall economy. So uh, on this slide, 122 million households in the U.S., so a significant population of households that can potentially get a mortgage. Uh, on the previous slide, you saw that there was a significant number of financial institutions, 13,000. Add to that the 4,500 title companies, independent abstractors. These are companies that help support the mortgage. So uh, if you add that to, you're talking about almost so 17,000 companies that support the mortgage market. And then on the right-hand side, over 8 million new home loans every year. So again, pretty significant size. Yeah, and I just want to jump in here. And we, this mortgage subgroup will be an invitation to all participants in the mortgage ecosystem, not just financial institutions, uh, but everybody who participates in that process. Thanks, Angel. Excellent point. Yeah, it's still within that same ethos of openness and inclusion. Uh, on this slide, again, some more data. You can see um, that 11 trillion um, in terms of the number of outstanding mortgages. I uh, compare that with the latest uh, U.S. GDP forecast of 22.785 trillion. So the mortgage market is huge half the size of the annual GDP. 
Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but this kind of shows just uh, the, uh, how the, the mortgage originations go uh, on a quarterly basis and then the average 30-year mortgage. Um, I, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about interest rates. And then finally, on this slide, this is just some of the information from the MBA, the Mortgage Bankers Association. That, that's the key source for a lot of our data. You can see the GDP growth rate, um, but really focus uh, down in the last line, total origination. Um, in 2020, 3.8 billion, 3.4 billion estimated in 2021. That'll probably come in a little higher. You can see that it starts to tail off a bit, but really this slide is, is again just intended to show you guys just the size of the overall mortgage market and some of the relevant data as well. Angel, anything you want to add to the mortgage data? So this was some of our research. We wanted to share it here. Um, you know, as starting the mortgage subgroup, we need to start creating some contacts about the mortgage market. We invite others to pr provide or share research that 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 is available for sharing uh, in other countries. We have some research. Uh, uh, in Europe that we're going to be adding in here as well. But we, again, as, as part of this mortgage subgroup, we want to be able to have information that provides the context uh, of the mortgage market, the size, the players. Um, then we start, want to start drilling into the process and really start providing some, some insights. Okay, great. So I think this is a good uh, segue. So I think at this point here, what we'd like to do, we're not gonna get into a, a lot of detail here, but what we wanted to do is just share with you a little bit from the consumer perspective and a little bit from a mortgage bank operating uh, model perspective. What are some of the challenges in the process? What does that look like? You know, How can we learn from this? And, and as we continue to learn and start the conversation, then we start asking the questions, you know, where can we apply blockchain? Where can we identify POCs? Where can we start extending uh, technologies that are blockchain enabled or create new blockchain uh, um, applications and solutions? Okay, so let's let's look at this a little bit from the U.S. Uh, mortgage consumer standpoint, right? So uh, everybody can shop online for a mortgage. You can apply for a loan um, online. Um, Closing online has been uh, has been increasing in the U.S. over the last couple of years, primarily driven by COVID, uh, to create contactless closing uh, opportunities. But we're still probably two three percent of all mortgages are closing online. That figure is expected to close. But from a customer experience, this is a major pain point. Next slide. So um, at a high level, 8 million loans annually on average, right, uh, in the US. So that's a pretty big number, pretty good scale. Um, as I said, a large majority of these loans are being uh, done still in a printing the documents, signing the documents, shipping the documents. You know, all of this creates delays. All of this impacts the customer experience, right? Uh, more importantly, for the mortgage bank players and the ecosystem, it creates more processes, more costs, more handoff, more verification points. Next slide. So here, let's. this is really where we start to talk a little bit about the security instrument, right, from a capital markets perspective, right? So what we've really been talking about is the origination of the mortgage, right? And so this gives you a little bit of insight in terms of who are some of the actors in this process. Um, in the loan origination process, there's a, a lot of handoff points, a lot of verification, a lot of identity checks, a lot of potential for fraud. Um, and, so, and so one of the things that happens is the security instruments get created. They leave this secured network and uh, they need to go to the local county recorder's office to get recorded, right? So, so in, in, there's about 3,900 county recorders across the US. Some of them are electronically enabled, some of them are not. So that creates another layer of complexity. Next slide. And so what we're doing here is we're, we're zooming in a little bit, not going to go through this in, in detail, but the purpose of this slide is just to 
share with the team here and the broader mortgage group and the capital market groups that the origination of a mortgage uh, is a complicated process. There's a lot of actors in the process, a lot of verification steps. We're talking about uh, obtaining income information from a borrower, uh, obtaining their assets, verifying their employment, uh, doing a property inspection, doing the valuation, looking at the title, looking at the title of the property, you know, is it, are there any liens on the property? So a lot of complexity uh, in this process. And um, so we're gonna be using this as a way to start the conversation to identify across the value chain, you know, where are the uh, biggest pain points and where are the opportunities to start a conversation around blockchain? And Angel, if I can interject, if you guys take a look at this uh, workflow, one of the things that we're also doing is identifying where some of the potential solutions are that may already exist. I'm sure you guys have been seeing a lot of the press releases and notifications about different organizations within the mortgage industry that are implementing different blockchain solutions. And all of those are really interspersed across the different process silos that you guys are taking a look at now. So we're going to conduct that inventory. And ideally, in the long-term solution is um, integrating the different blockchain, excuse me, blockchain solutions into a single ecosystem. Angel? Great. Thank you, Marvin. Next slide, please. So uh, Dr. Lassity, many of you guys may uh, know her. She was a keynote speaker at the Global Ledger event. Um, that's when we became uh, aware of the Center of Excellence that she runs. Uh, we're a big fan of her research. We've started reading it. We'd like to schedule a visit and really learn uh, at a deeper level what they're doing there. But I think based on her experience in driving blockchain POCs, being a research center, being a, a center of excellence, I think she really sums it up really nicely, um, her experience and how that could be applied to the mortgage industry, right? And so uh, verifying identities, attesting to the uh, to authenticity of an asset, right? Um, that is really the biggest, that is the crux of the mortgage process. And we're looking forward to partnering with the doctor and her research group and identifying best practices and how we can cross fertilate uh, ideas and solutions uh, from her work to the mortgage subgroup. Okay, um, on this slide, it walks you through the relationship between capital markets and the mortgage industry. And most, if not all of the people on this call should already be pretty familiar with that. Capital markets support the liquidity of the mortgage market through the sale and purchase uh, of mortgage-backed securities. And it's this relationship that I think we want to leverage in setting up the mortgage subgroup, since uh, mortgages are a key part uh, of the capital markets. I, I think it definitely makes sense to have mortgage be a part of the capital market SIG, as this slide underscores. And then as we continue to grow, um, then we can exchange information between capital markets um, and, and the mortgage stake, um, the insurance subgroup within capital markets and mortgage. So we really wanna take advantage of that community that the capital market SIG offers. And that's really what the slide is, is meant to underscore. And then on the next one, we've talked about the rationale between capital markets and mortgage. And here we're starting to think about, okay, where can we take the mortgage subgroup? Um, this could just be the starting point of helping to roll out blockchain with the uh, different realtor groups on the uh, lower left-hand side. Uh, builder blockchain, kind of recorder blockchain, and it really starting to include the different parties that are part of the mortgage value chain that we alluded to at the beginning. 
And what we've included here in the upper right is we've already started to identify, and I think I mentioned this on earlier slide, some of the different organizations that are already rolling out different point solutions. You guys have probably heard about fluidity, excuse me, uh, liquid mortgage, fluidity, provenance. Those are some of the other organizations that are already in this space. And I think if we bring them in, they'd want to participate with this type of community. Yeah, Marvin, that's a great point. I, one of the things that I'd like to add to this is just a little bit of uh, some recent news, right? So we have um, Liquid Mortgage just got issued a, a uh, patent. They're focusing on uh, blockchain solutions. Uh, we have uh, Figure and Homebridge, uh, a top mortgage uh, bank in the U.S., have merged to uh, start pursuing uh, blockchain technologies to advance mortgages. Uh, we have in the title space, so if you look down at the bottom right, the loan manufacturing vendor ecosystem, we have title companies, uh, First American, Old Republic, who are collaborating and looking at blockchain for solutions. And if you go over to the left side and you look at the blockchain county recorder's office, we have the first uh, county in the United States, Riverside County, who is working on a blockchain project as well. So there definitely the uh, there are blockchain initiatives across this entire value chain. Everybody plays a role in this process. Uh, right now, there is no central group uh, where the community can come together. And that is one of the purposes of the mortgage subgroup is to start creating that awareness, bringing these players together, bringing them into the conversation, and so that we can start exploring uh, blockchain solutions. So um, I think the other exciting news that we have uh, on a global front is in Spain. So they're looking to uh, allow mortgage uh, mortgages to be paid by crypto, right? And so um, again, if anybody has any news around the world regarding mortgages, you know, please send it our way. One of the things that we want to create is kind of a central place to go to see uh, the developments that are happening in the, around the world. And if we can create that awareness, we can start reaching out to those folks and, and bringing them into the conversation. Thanks, Back Angel. Okay, uh, benefits of blockchain. Um, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on here since mo most if not all the people on the call are already pretty familiar with blockchain. You guys have been working on this for quite a while and you guys probably already know uh, these benefits. You guys have probably already implemented projects related to these benefits, I mean, but just really quickly. I mean, reduced uh, servicing costs is one of the key aspects. Um, you can see some of the cost uh, in a non-performing loan versus a performing loan. Reduced servicing costs via blockchain would help significantly lower that through automation. Um, faster, easy securitization, so again, related to capital markets. And then uh, another key aspect is regulatory compliance with the transparency, um, uh, trustless environment. It, the regulatory compliance becomes a lot easier, um, and, and it significantly lowers that cost. Uh, on the next slide, we wanted to just dive down a little bit on some of those benefits. So one of the key things that really jump out at us right off the bat on the benefits is those uh, benefits related to smart contracts. Um, we've heard of organizations that have already taken some of the key aspects uh, of the legal requirement um, related to mortgages, uh, such as a letter of, uh, uh, of attorney. Um, those are things that can be put into a smart contract. Uh, payments um, can be put into a smart contract. So those are just some of the really obvious examples that can be put into a smart contract. But one of the key ways that we can leverage blockchain and, and help facilitate uh, a mortgage. Um, and another one, is, and this is really just focused on the U.S. market, but to uh, Angel's point, we do understand that mortgages are global, uh, maybe not necessarily the same flavor, but uh, still the same, uh, still have some similarities, is uh, some of the different um, aspects of, of a mortgage can be put into a blockchain use case. Um, it will help simplify the process, so uh, you can log on anywhere, any 
any time to um, sign up for a mortgage and facilitate it through that pretty long process. Review and sign your documents online. This is already starting to happen in, in the signing space with companies like DocuSign and eSign Capabilities. And, and then uh, documents being recorded and delivered to the investor. I think this is one of the key things that we already spoke about. Um, Angel, you want? did you want to add anything to that last slide? Yeah, if you just go back to it, right? Um, so, so one of the things, you know, we talked about the mortgage, right? So Marvin, we talk about the experience, right? There's so many aspects to this, not just the consumer experience, but, you know, what does that mean to business, right? We want to have a business conversation as well as a technology conversation. And then within those conversations, we always want to keep uh, center is the customer experience, right? And so um, when we think about blockchain as a use case, uh, it has... We, we've studied uh, WeTrade that is uh, up and running by IBM in, in Europe, and a lot of the a, a lot of the goals and objectives of that project to make things secure, make it simple, make it easy, uh, make it open and accessible. Right, all those concepts and applications apply in the mortgage use case. Right, this is a U.S. Uh, centric perspective, but it, it really applies uh, on, a, on a global basis, right? Um, and so that's one of the things I just wanted to add. Very importantly, it, our conversations are going to be around the business, the technology, and then the consumer, the borrower, who is getting those services and uh, the experience that blockchain is going to bring to that end consumer, that end user, and how it's going to transform their life, make it easier, make it more secure, make it more transparent. Um, and so that's, that's what we're looking to do in, in this mortgage subgroup. We invite everybody to bring their ideas uh, on, on what the conversation should be, but that's, those are gonna be the, the main conversation points, uh, if you will. So with that, um, I think our time is done. Uh, I, I wanna thank uh, Hyperledger, uh, Vipin, Kirthi, Karen, for helping us uh, get to this point. Uh, I think, Vipin, we'll turn it over to you and uh, see if there's any questions or, or um, how, you, how would you like to proceed. So thank you, everybody. Looking forward to this journey. Thank you, everyone. Great. Um, now, I think the thing to do now is to ask questions. Uh, and if anybody has questions, please come forward right now. Um, Dipin, in the chat, uh, someone raised a question about commercial mortgages. Um, That's me. Have at that and, and Angel, if you want to uh, chime in. That, oh, oh, OK. Um, that was me. <laughs> anyway. OK. Um, uh, my background, and I think Angel's background, is primarily within residential mortgages, but this does not exclude commercial mortgages. I think that that's something that there is some similarities in the process, and more importantly, some similarities in the problems and potential solutions. So we are definitely open to including commercial mortgages w within this effort. Angel? Yeah, I, I think... Obviously, our backgrounds are residential uh, mortgages. There's definitely application. Uh, I hope we can inspire our commercial colleagues to create a subgroup that's more focused in the commercial space and, and look, at, look at what we can learn from the capital market SIG, the other SIGs across the Hyperledger uh, community, and have them start a conversation uh, around commercial mortgages. Um, in terms of the size, do you have any idea of uh, how much, what, what commercial mortgages constitute? No, I, I don't have any data on commercials. It's, we, we can provide, um, we can do some research and come back to you and provide you a full view of all the mortgages. So stepping back a little bit, uh, there is a tendency for there to be, uh, for us to fragment into silos, right? I mean, like you just said, suggested, for example, the commercial mortgages could become their own subgroup. 
there is also the opposite uh, centripetal force that brings us together, which is, of course, the hyperledger uh, umbrella itself. But more than that, there are some common problems across all of the blockchain solutions in uh, all the different verticals. Uh, they include things like identity tokenization, um, you know, payment systems, settlement systems, uh, various other topics. And that's not even just confined to capital markets, but to anything that is other, you know, that is goes by the name of blockchain. Of course, we are not talking about the technical underpinnings, which, which also share in terms of the, uh, in terms of the infrastructure, you know, it's supposed to be infrastructure. Um, so what do you, you know, there are some initiatives there uh, in uniting not only just within the SIG, but with between SIGs. And I hope you guys will take a look at that uh, effort here in Hyperledger. And we are trying to uh, build a systemization of knowledge uh, corresponding to these features that we mentioned before, which is performance and scale, uh, you know, number of transactions per second, how do you do uh, document, uh, basically signing of documents. These are all uh, problems that exist across the different silos. And uh, hence we are, uh, you know, we wanna encourage you guys to get to that. But before that, uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Otherwise, I will, um, you know, I'll go for more questions and more, let's say, discussions. Um, anyone else? Uh, questions? Dan, Igor? I think we I have think some questions going in the chat right now. I do have a question on my own after we can address yeah, those. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, perhaps I have misheard, but uh, you've mentioned that one of the uh, challenges or problems that you will try to solve is uh, where uh, people get uh, mortgage denied. Uh, did I hear this correct or I misheard that point? Uh, no, I don't, I, I don't think we stated that. Okay, I must have misheard that. Sorry about that. I'll withdraw my question. Yeah, I think that presents a whole set of problems that we're really not uh, equipped to address is why people get mortgages denied. Well, that's a, um, you know, going back to the, um, let's say, uh, scoring processes and debiasing of scoring algorithms with uh, machine learning is a very important topic, uh, which I am actually working on in another area, but I am in touch with, uh, uh, you know, Fair Housing Authority, whose main concern is credit denials to people, mostly for mortgages, I, I assume, because they can also be for credit cards or anything else. But anyway, that's a, like you said, it's, it's, it's another one of those topics. Um, so here are so, some of the questions. So Vipin, can I just chime in? I yeah. actually want to chime in with a, uh, an echo of something you touched on a moment ago. And that is if we look at, I think leaving aside blockchain for a second and we just look at the, you know, the more recent history of capital markets, um, we've seen pretty much a convergence of product types. And while an individual loan, you know, it is in itself has loads of workflow, we also know, of course, that one of the biggest industries in the world is the, the pooling of mortgages and the creation of um, more tra uh, tradable pools. So I guess the point to make here 
on the back of that is to reiterate your comment earlier is that there's, if we're looking to create automated solutions to make the operating environment better, the, the interfaces between the, the types of solutions have to be solid, right? And, and so, and I can appreciate that pre, um, that pre-pooling in the case of retail mortgages or pre-trade, you know, pre-post issuance and or post loan in the case of um, wholesale or commercial mortgages um, is a specific set of processes, but the intersection point, once they become closer to traded assets, that seems to be the 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 bigger the bigger opportunity and the thing which you know even the CLO market is trying to handle. So as you guys embark upon thinking about mortgages in specific, I think the synergy with capital markets is urgent. And if we don't get that right, uh, we end up with, uh, you know, just an, one mess replacing another mess. You're talking Absolutely. about interoperability or uh, anything? Uh, no, interoperability. Sorry, like if I think about the process chain of mortgages as an asset, similar to the process chain of loans into CLOs as an asset, there is a point at which it becomes, a, you know, where institutional, where it shifts to institutional focus. And if I say capital markets, SIG is really focused in some respects on in the institutional side, that if we don't get the, that transition right, we end up with, um, you know, um, a reflection of the problem we have today, which is lots of fragmented activity and, you know, and a difficulty to know. I mean, think about how many banks have huge operations where they consume mortgage tapes, parsing them, trying to figure out what the pay down has been in, a, in an individual pool. It's like, you know, it's almost as, it's hugely duplicative between banks and a mess. And I'm sure that the tapes are not always read properly or the tapes, whatever the files are, are not always read properly. Um, and, there are, and there are errors. And so this process where we go from a more individual process to a more institutional process really needs to be in, integrated in a, in a deep way. And so the concern is if we're gonna focus, have a, there's going to be a group that's focused on mortgages and one presumes that its area of deep focus is gonna be um, the thing leading up to the loan having uh, been issued and maybe it's and the life cycle of the loan, then it needs a deep integration with the capital market side. And I think that that was your point earlier, which you said in one sentence and I said in three or four minutes of blather. <laughs> oh, Dan. Dan, that was great, uh, and that's exactly right. Um, so, the 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 manufacturing of the mortgage is a critical component, right? That has to integrate seamlessly into the post closing investor delivery functions, then integrate seamlessly into the issuance processes, then integrate seamlessly into you know the reporting of the asset, the performance, the analytics, yeah. Uh, you know, the investor accountings, all, all, all that good stuff, right? So today they're all, they get cut off, right? You originate the loan, boom, we're done. You send it over to post-closing, they re-underwrite the loan, right? You send it over to investor delivery, they re-underwrite they re the loan. You send the loan over to a wholesale investor, they re-underwrite the loan, right? And so, um, yeah, point taken, I completely agree. And I think this is one of the reasons why, you know, we're part of the capital market SIG is that there are those synergies uh, it's, it is part of a broader chain, right? And it is a big chain and being, being part of this conversation, listening to your insights and feedback, bringing that into the mortgage subgroup, Vipin's leadership, everybody's leadership on here, making sure that the conversation uh, um, gets considered and we think about those synergies and we think about how we implement those POCs. And Dan, you bring up an excellent point. And just to give you an indication of how we've seen this problem progress, in, back in the day, Angel and I saw literally pallets of loan documents being sent from 
um, Countrywide and Bank of America to different institutional investors. And I'm sure they were taking those pallets of loan documents. And it was literally pallets of documents being sent from one entity to another and someone is going through and having to revalidate that information and that now i'm sure that the palace is still being sent but that those documents are in an electronic format but someone is still revalidating that information blockchain can take out the validation or the revalidation that all of those entities have to have to undergo as this information is being passed from one group to another and they can just trust in the initial set of information so definitely agree with you with the need for that interoperability and that that's one of the key pain points i do see some questions on the chat which i'll read out uh and uh because you guys are focused on the presentation. I'll try to help you out here. Uh, unless uh, you want to continue on the same vein or you want to say something about these questions, which is uh, money is asked, how do you plan to address regulations across many jurisdictions? Yeah, so I... Again, we want to invite everybody that's part of this uh, ecosystem. Regulators are very, very important. And so depending on the jurisdiction that we're operating in, we want uh, representation. We want them to have a voice at the table. We want them to be aware. It's an educational opportunity to bring the regulators into the process um, and look for their guidance, right? And educate so that we can innovate. And this is one of the questions we first raised when we first started speaking with Hyperledger. From the Hyperledger forum, we didn't see participation from regulatory bodies, from governmental bodies, and we wanted to make sure that you guys were open to that, because for this to be successful, we do have to have participation from the regulatory bodies, Fannie Mae, uh, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, all of those guys need to be a part of this. Yeah, actually, Ron, who was on the call, has written uh, extensively on uh, regulations, not just in America, but across, I mean, they have produced a book that uh, looks at blockchain regulations across the world, but it's not obviously focused solely on uh, this. But I have two other, uh, several other questions. So let me just go ahead and say that. Uh, land titles are also an important part in blockchain. Uh, let's connect. Uh, so basically something about registries, I guess, uh, because it is a fragmented landscape when it comes to re registries because it's counties, local governments that keep the registries. And uh, there should be some kind of a, a connection between that and a pool that is composed of multiple mortgages uh, that are in different parts of the country. And the only thing, obviously, that you know is during the closing process, there is a title, um, title insurance or something else that ensures that that, that is solid. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think so what we've seen, at least in the U.S., and we're welcome to uh, other activities are happening around the globe, but in the U.S., the Riverside County, which is based in uh, California, has started an initiative for blockchain technology. They recognized from what we've seen and the research that we've done there, we haven't spoken to anybody yet, but we'd like to invite them to come here and present and tell us what they see and share their experience and how they're going about it. Um, is based on what they're reporting and what's available in the public, right? They, they, they've recognized that, um, you know, being a large county, managing data on legacy systems, right? Not having the accurate title at some points in time, also protecting their constituents from potential equity stripping, right? So those are some of the top concerns that the county has uh, in terms of managing title. Um, and so it's, it's, it's definitely, uh, a, for what we see, a, a, a great step yeah, that they're taking. Uh, and we want to have them be part of this group. 
Uh, and there's the also a real interesting article. Um, I was trying to dig it up, and, and I can send the rest, um, that out to the team. Uh, there was an interesting article published about a, a month or so ago um, that said, does blockchain eliminate the need for title insurance? Because if you have the history behind a piece of property and it's been validated and it's contained within the blockchain, does that completely eliminate the need for title insurance? And then some of the data that was included in that is there were several, uh, I think, realtors or people within um, the title industry or the real estate industry that said that in their 25, 30 years of, of experience, no one had seen a title insurance claim. So I, I know that those are all just points of data and anecdotal at best, but in those are that's some of the information that's out there, at least as it relates to title and blockchain. Uh, there's another question from Elizabeth, which says, do you use an option alternative? I don't know exactly what that means. Elizabeth, would you care to explain? Following question is more interesting. You can skip that one. <laughs> okay. Um, well, the optionality of mortgages is what makes them complicated. And the... Uh, basically the gamma of mortgages. Anyway, let's not go into the... Uh, she's also asked other questions. Where, where on the ledger do you put the environmental credit? Is there a seller trying to reduce a carbon footprint offering a trade? Is there a zero interest rate or a coupon, a zero down payment or zero principal for an applicant with a zero carbon footprint? Yeah, those are good questions. And I think that's something uh, that's an aspect of the discussion, right? Um, when you start getting into uh, mortgage product development, mortgage uh, security issuance, uh, trading, et cetera, you know, what, what are the features and characteristics of that mortgage? How can you make a mortgage more sustainable? How can it be more green? And how can this, uh, you know, how can blockchain be an enabler for that? Um. There is a um, uh, hand up, Alfonso. You have the ha your hand up for quite a while. I just want to yes. invite you. Thank you, Vipin. Uh, thank you, uh, Angel and Marvin, for, for a great presentation. What I see here is it's a great opportunity to connect the points, okay, to do the bridging the silos that Vipin was, was referring to, uh, because homes are a very important part of cities. And financing is a great entry point. In some other cases in the world, like for instance, I'm going to talk about Ghana. Okay, and Accra uh, began the land title registration and blockchain through an alliance with the financial institutions that were giving the mortgages. So rather than starting with, with the counties and you know, the typical political um, approach, they said to the banks and the mortgage institutions, let's every mortgage that you approve, let's register the land title, okay? So that the next time it comes into the market, it's already sold, okay? So that's, that's a, I think, a very clever way of connecting uh, urban and political issues with, with finance. And so I'd like very much uh, what, what you presented because it opens up a whole chain of events related to homes, families, cities. And for those different parts and components, uh, there are plenty of, of relevant blockchain applications. Thank you. Thank you, Alfonso. Looking forward to collaborating with you. It'll be a pleasure. Um, there is another question that brings us back to the rationale for having this on the blockchain, which is, uh, you know, probably answered in your slides, but uh, Ashish is asking something about the fact, uh, what does a blockchain do better than, let's say, electronic, database of land and property records connected with the FinTech uh, lending platform. 
I mean, which I, I, you know, you you guys did talk about it, but yes. maybe it's good to reiterate. Right. That. So, so I think that's a great question. Um, you know, just some of the things that we've seen. Um, at the end of the day, blockchain. You know, if you go at it alone as an institution, you're going to be in a centralized, siloed technology platform from a mortgage originator perspective, right? Um, blockchain is about consortia, right? Having other parties be part of it, part, be open, share information. So let's think about one of the big fraud uh, risks that occur in 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 the U.S. from a mortgage application standpoint. So there's um, what's called double lapping, triple lapping, right? So you have a consumer who's applying for a loan, equity stripping uh, or cash out refi on one property, but they're applying with multiple lenders, right? So each lender is in their own system. Each lender is processing their own application. If all these loans close at the same time, right? Um, that fraud event was successful, right? And so by one, one uh, benefit in this fraud scenario of being part of a blockchain is that these applications will be shared among the lenders and the fraud can be identified, it could be investigated and put on a path for resolution to mitigate or eliminate fraud, right? So that's just one use case from a fraud perspective. Um, in a centralized mortgage operating model, right? Uh, scale is what matters, scales what drives the budget for technologies, right? And so you, you're creating and managing your own uh, ecosystem, how you interact with the various vendors, how you order appraisal, how you order title, right? Um, and so uh, you're only as good as your APIs, you're only as good as your technology, you're only as good as your process. Um, and that dictates a big part of, of your operating costs, right? To fund a, a mortgage in the US, it's about $9,000, somewhere around in that range. Uh, that's extremely, extremely uh, expensive. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities to, to make it more streamlined. So when you go to blockchain, right, uh, one, one of the biggest things that we see that creates a lot of turn, a lot of churn is the anxiety of the mortgage process itself, the anxiety that this loan is going to close, right? Because if the loan doesn't close, there is no economic event, right? And so, uh, you know, is Alfonso's loan on track, right? And so, it's, so that requires a status, a proof of work, a proof of event, right? And so, everybody's going to call, everybody's going to email, everybody's going to follow up multiple times to make sure that Alfonso's loan is on track to close tomorrow at 2 p.m., right? Um, and then at, at, I, I won't get into all the details, but there's a significant amount of that. So can blockchain with its proof of work, proof of event technologies be a, a truth that everybody can rely on, that everybody has access to, so that we eliminate that operational anxiety of this loan closing and everybody has that proof of work that, a, Alfonso's loan is scheduled for 2 p.m. tomorrow, and that's what we know at this point in time, and it's done, and all the churn goes away, right? There's definitely fallout risk from the event tomorrow, but that's a separate issue, but that's one of the advantages of, of, of blockchain, and there's others. Um, the, other, um, the other point is what you mentioned just now, which is scale. Um, as we know, the downfall of uh, people like uh, Countrywide and others happened because of the pressure to produce and scale. It became a machine, an engine, a uh, sort of a unthink, almost like you're executing uh, and you your anxiety to close uh, it's not just the homeowner, but also the financier, because once you close, you originate those loans and then you can sell them into the secondary market. Uh, and if you can make those processes uh, so fast, then it um, allows for essentially monopolies. I mean, 
you know, um, I mean, I don't want to call it that way, but that's what happens when you have uh, these kind of incentives driving the market. So will the advent of blockchain um, create more of a decentralized play so that the infrastructure is shared and then there are more people who can get into the market, maybe even a uh, decentralized marketplace like, you know, uh, loans from individuals to help. Uh, I mean, it's already been done in short-term loans, uh, but obviously the duration of mortgages make it very difficult. But right. since there is a secondary market, uh, there can be a way to, uh, you know, leapfrog from a longer duration into a shorter duration. I mean, which is what, which is what, um, basically what uh, the uh, securitization does. I mean, uh, pooling, all that stuff. So what do you think of uh, that as a sort of side note to what you just said? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I, I think it's definitely part of the conversation. We we need to think about that, right? I think the benefits of blockchain, you know, talking a little bit about that anxiety is the loan going to close. You know, that anxiety happens uh, upstream as well, right? So Dan made some great points about making sure that 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 information, that data flows all the way up to the issuance and all the way up to the investor and in performance reporting of that asset, right? And so. You know, just think about, you know, I apply for a loan, I submit my pay stubs, or they get them electronically, and they verify my income. What we're really worried about now between now and the, and the time my loan closes, or in the future is did my income change, right? But if my income doesn't change, then why is my income need to be repooled, reverified multiple times within the loan origination process? Why does it have to be uh, reverified during the investor delivery process? You know, why does it have to be re-verified in the due diligence of uh, delivery of whole loans to secondary investors, right? Uh, so, so what do we, if, 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 we, if it's been verified once in the blockchain, you know, the question is, can we rely on that? Is that the truth, right? And if it is on blockchain and we are all um, are, are comfortable with the blockchain and the integrity of the blockchain and how it works, then we can rely on that data point all the way until my last payment of my 30th year uh, of going into this mortgage, right? Unless there's a change, right? So what we wanna do is really start looking at data and saying, hey, if it's part of the blockchain, it's a proof of an event, it's proof of status, it's proof of data, um, let's, let's build on top of that. But as we start to build on that, we're also streamlining and removing friction, anxiety, processes, re-verification of work, and we're streamlining things and it gives us a better opportunity to start connecting these dots, right? So how do we connect? How do we connect to the land registries? How do we connect to the valuation of the property? How do we connect to the secondary market players? How do we connect to the warehouse lenders? How do we connect to the issuance and the government uh, sponsored uh, agencies, uh, enterprises? How do we connect to, um, you know, the rating agencies? How do we, how does all that data connect and if we look at the mortgage subgroup as an opportunity to start that conversation, um, it's, it's definitely gonna be an interesting conversation for sure. But that's, that's, that's the opportunity here, right? The network of network effects with blockchain. And, and just to add to the points that uh, Angel made, um, it's removal of that friction that I think will address some of the creation of monopolies that you were uh, alluding to, Vipin. And one of the reasons why Countrywide was so successful and it eventually became, as you say, a monopoly is because it had better systems than anyone else. And now you're seeing the creation of similar entities like Loan Depot, and they're one of the biggest loan originators, non-bank originators in the U.S., and that's because they have better systems than anyone else. Hopefully, blockchain will remove the friction in the mortgage value chain that will level the playing field, was I think the term that you used, to allow smaller parties so that that type of 
monopolization or creation of these large entities doesn't happen. Oh, very delightful. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Looks like there are some people uh, here on uh, uh, another call, probably. I don't know. But, uh, you know, unless there's someone else, uh, we can continue this conversation for five more minutes. But uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I haven't looked carefully to see whether there are others uh, who are taking over this. Uh, is there... Is there a call scheduled on this on this um, particular Zoom link? Does anybody know? Otherwise, we can continue for a few um, few more. Uh, and I think uh, many of these people are bringing forth, uh, like Boulevard, uh, like Elizabeth Green. Uh, the possibility of external data, which is very, uh, you know, kind of trusted, trusted external data, oracles, of course. I mean, that's normally what we call them, but oracle is uh, it's a bad name, according to me, because oracle uh, needs interpretation, right? I mean, Oracle only speaks in very vague terms. And of course, almost always you need to see what that actually means. But in, a, in this sense, it is the truth from the outside world coming into the uh, blockchain system. Uh, and that's not only for the issuance part, but for the performance part. Uh, I was intimately involved with uh, Intex data, and with uh, there was another supplier of pool uh, performance data that we had to download monthly, and it was very, very, uh, you know, like on the fourth of the month, fourth business day, it was a big deal. Unless you have this properly done, you can't calculate payment risk. So this is all about outside data. Uh, anyway, we can we can close the call, but there are a lot of interesting points that have been raised. And I will put uh, put the recording as well as some of these questions, and it's for uh, you guys to start taking this forward. And I can participate to whatever extent I can. You know. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.